this is such an exciting topic. It's such a wonderful thing to see all of you. Um, I was asking kind of who's here today, and they, they mentioned that the top uh, pharma companies here in Korea are uh, attending. That's wonderful. A um, lot of the uh, groups here are from biologics. That's fantastic. Uh, some of you are from small molecule. Uh, that's great, too. And it's just a wonderful time to be involved in drug development. And it really, um, it's, I have such a passion for this topic, and I hope that um, you get the chance to really realize the, the things that we talk about here are so meaningful and have such a big impact on the work that we do to, day to day. Um, if you really think about it, uh, the world has changed, and it hasn't changed a little bit. It's changed a lot. If you look at traditional drug development and traditional drug manufacturing uh, that has occurred over the last uh, 10, 15, 20 years, we've seen big changes. And if your organization hasn't also changed with the times, you'll find that your organization is getting going to get left behind. Um, and I think that's a real issue for a lot of organizations because we so know traditional drug manufacturing, traditional characterization, traditional development, traditional timelines. All that's changing. The traditions are pretty well going out the door. We'll still have a lot of the requirements. Uh, that's not going to change. But how we address those requirements, how we fulfill the requirements, that's changing a lot. And I think the thing that's really changing it, uh, having a big influence on it, which may not be obvious to some of you, but if you work in gene therapy or cell therapy programs, uh, individualized medicine, these areas, we have to do everything that's in ICH, but we have to do it much more efficiently, and we have to do it much more quickly. So how do we meet all of the expectations of ICH, all of the expectations of regulatory, and still develop a drug that is world-class, it would meet all the regulatory and health authorities' requirements, but it also can be done efficiently and can be done quickly at low cost. So that's the challenge. That's the challenge we have. And as I do my presentation, I'm going to show you different approaches. Some of these you'll look at and say, oh, yeah, of course, that's what you do. And some of the approaches you'll look at and say, we don't really do that, uh, and we don't do it that way. And what I'm going to show you, I believe, is best practice. And the reason why I say that it's best practice, uh, in my consultancy, we have the privilege of working with some of the top companies globally. Uh, that's uh, top U.S. companies in biologics and, and in pharma, uh, also top companies uh, globally. So in Asia, uh, we also work with companies in China, we work with companies in Singapore uh, and Japan, and we also work with operations in Europe. So we're very familiar with FDA requirements, what they want, what they're looking for. We're very familiar with EMA, what they would like, and then some of the unique requirements that we see coming out of Japan and even out of odd places such as Russia or other places in the world. So really understanding the global uh, um, environment and really understanding how uh, this all is kind of transforming, I think is really, really helpful. Now let's take a look at the title of the presentation. Modern drug development. Modern drug development, I, so people either love the word QBD or they hate the word QBD. So if you're a lover, great, I'll talk about it for your love. If you're a hater, you hate QBD, I'll give you another word you can use. So quality by design was the initiative that came about from the FDA in the year 2000. They wanted to reinvent how drugs are developed. And so they came up with the term quality by design. And the idea there was is that you could design a product and design a process in such a way that it would meet all the quality objectives and provide world-class quality. That was the idea. Today, that idea is gone. Really, the need to call it QBD from now and in the future, you don't, there's no need. All we have to do is follow ICH. ICH is QBD. There is no QBD. You can't, there is no such thing as QBD, uh, development, QBD filing, all that is old idea. It's wrong idea. There's just filings. There's just regulatory. There's just submission. So this idea, oh, maybe we do a QBD submission, maybe we do a traditional submission. That's gone. That was gone three years ago, four years ago, gone. If you're still thinking this way, oh, we'll do traditional development. You're in the past. You're maybe five to six years in the past. And you have no future with that concept. 
So I just tell it to you as your friend, not as your enemy, but as your friend. Old thinking is very dangerous in pharma development because the world is different. And the regulatory environment is very different than it was five years ago. So we'll, we'll talk about that. Modern drug development is a nicer way to say it. ICH compliance, very good way to think of it. QBD if you like. So whatever word or terminology you think suits you best or is best for your company, not following ICH is such a dangerous thing to do. And the thing I'm going to talk about today is how do you do that? How, what are the regulatory requirements? What are the things that are ne necessary? How do we make sure that when we develop things and when we write our, our BLAs, our submissions, when we go for licensure, how do we put together a compelling story that really shows that we have what the health authorities really want to see and we have a properly developed drug? Now, the alternative of doing it properly is to do it improperly. And let me just describe improper drug development just for a moment. What does improper drug development look like? It looks something like this. Um, we had two years, three years to do the development. Uh, we ran out of time. We have no more time. So whatever we did must be okay. So we take that and we package it, and we go to the health authorities and see if they're okay. Super, super bad idea. Because now, it's not about doing proper development, it's just how much time do you have? And you're limited, everything is gated by time, and not based on strategy. So that concept of having a certain amount of time, and that's how much time you have development, and when you run out of time, you try to put together a good story. That won't make a good story it will make a very bad story that somebody has to try to put together. And then the health authorities, when they receive your submission, they try to understand what you've given them. It doesn't make any sense because it's not a really good way to organize and present and communicate the level of information and the level of knowledge that you've acquired for cell culture, for purification, for formulation, for analytical methods. So it's really important that we can understand how do we build that story in a very quick timeline so that when we put that story together, it's really a compelling story. It's easy to understand, easy to follow, and scientifically justified. Think about that. Think about that. Easy to understand, easy to communicate, easy to follow, and scientifically justified. If you could get people to do that, what a powerful thing uh, you'll have. And as you see my presentation, you'll see kind of how we do that. What are the best practices? What are the ways in which that story can be organized? Um, my presentation, I have several different things I want to show you. Um, and also, just uh, as we're going along, I'm sure you're going to have questions. So as you have questions, I recommend that you write some of those down, because we're going to hold questions for a bit until we get towards the end. And when we get to the end, we'll open it up for questions. So as many questions as you want to ask, I am more than patient and happy to answer those for you. Um, but as you see certain things, the questions will come to mind. Well, how do you do that? Or how does that imply on this? Or how does that relate to small molecule work? Or, or molecular synthesis? Or how does that apply to purification? Or how does that apply to anything I do? Please uh, write those down, and when we get to the Q&A section, you'll have lots of good things, and we can open those up. And then maybe we can learn from each other what are the challenges, what are some of the concerns, and see what are some approaches, things we can do to address those. I'll try to give you the best information I can, and then you, uh, you know, what, what else comes to mind? What else triggered a thought for you that you would like to have answered? I don't promise to have every answer, but I can probably help you on most of them. Okay. Um, so here we go. I think an easy way to digest this is to kind of look at this as these 10 key elements. And this is kind of the highlights of what the FDA was trying to do when it introduced quality by design. It laid out these different specific concepts that we really want to make sure that we follow and use. And then these are emphasized in regulatory documents. The primary regulatory document by the way, that really hits home what QBD is all about is Q8. 
So uh, a good reading of, Q of Q8. Q8 is an amazing document. If you really read and understand ICH Q8, you get a beautiful insight as to what they were really going for. And ICH Q8 was written after they made their pronouncement. So in kind of the year from the year 2000 to 2010, right? From two, so if you think about it, we're almost uh, 19 years since the onset of Quality by Design. For 10 years, from 2000 to 2010, 2011, even as late as 2015, the guidance documents were rewritten. Almost all of the guidance documents that we use today occurred in that 2000 to 2015 range. There's a few of them that are older, but not many. Most of them were rewritten. And they were rewritten for the modern drug development, not the traditional, but the modern. And one of the agencies, what, one of the things they had in mind, they said, well, maybe we want people to change the way they do development. We want people to know a lot more about the drug. We're tired of having problems with drug. We're, problem with, we're tired of having people not know how to manufacture it reliably. We're tired of all the issues we see. We want world-class quality from drug manufacturers, from drug developers. So they, they looked at that idea and they said, okay, fine. Let's, let's think about what we want. Let's give people 10 years and they could do any kind of filing they want. For 10 years after the introduction of QBD, they said, okay, you could do traditional filing if you like. It's okay. You could do modern QBD filing if you like. After 2013, they said, stop, stop, stop. It's just submit and follow guidance. There is no such thing as a QBD filing. There's only filings. So to, after 2013, the day came and went when QBD was optional. And anybody that puts together a filing after 2013, they put their filing at risk if they try to do it in a traditional drug filing. And the argument that people have used is, well, we've always done it this way before, and it's fine. Wow, what a dangerous, dangerous argument. You put your whole program at risk. All you need to do is see rejected. Why is the submission rejected? Failure to demonstrate adequate process understanding. Failure to demonstrate adequate product knowledge. Fail. Give you a year or two, come back and see us when you're ready. All you have to do is see one or two of those failings to see a, a complete uh, loss of capital time and the therapeutic or clinical benefits also of those super, super important. We didn't lose that. So, those are real things, and we've seen the rejections, and we've seen the failures where they do, are not happy with the way the filing is. So these 10 elements are the ones that we're going to be looking at as we try to kind of walk through what are the things that the agencies are specifically asking for. And secondly, how do you fulfill them? What do you do in your submissions and in your development to make sure you meet those expectations? So that's what we're here for. And if, if you're here for that, you came to the right place. If you're wondering why you came, because your boss told you to, maybe you'll discover something anyway. So you, you're here for whatever reason you're here for, but we're I ho hoping that's why you came. Um, traditional drug development, what is that really all about? It's mostly about test, test, test. Um, it also often, if you look at the second point here, it's a lot of times based on, well, we tried some stuff. We tried this. We tried this buffer. We tried this surfactant. We tried this uh, reagent. And by trying these things, we got a pretty good result. That's a very old concept. Try, try. Thomas Edison, when he invented the light bulb, he was a try, try, try guy. Right? Try all these different things. Try, 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 try. And then something sort of worked. And the uh, Carbon tungsten filament seemed to be pretty good, and so we said, okay, voila, light bulb. In drug manufacturing, many people love to go to the lab and try. Try, try, try. They just try stuff. Oh, this one seems to work okay. Seems to be pretty stable. Seems to be pretty okay. Clinically, we don't have any complaints. So, solution. Uh, that is not acceptable. What do you mean that's not acceptable? That is not acceptable. Why not? Why isn't I tried something? Looks pretty good. That's my solution. 
What's wrong with that? Do you know what I'm talking about? What's wrong with that? Why is that not okay? Because what made it good? That is what we're doing now. That's the difference. So if you look at old versus new, a simplest way I can describe it is in the old world, we would try stuff. And if it seemed to work, that's, we can show the data and show it's stable. And it seems to work. And the agencies would look at that. Oh, it does seem to work. Cool, good, happy. And the today, it's like you've got to know what makes it work. Mechanistic, no mechanistic understanding. Mechanistically, what makes it work? And by how much? And what makes it fail? So the level of understanding that we need today is very different than what we needed 10 years ago, five years ago. And the thing that makes the world so different is not only are the requirements clear, that that's what is expected. The second thing that makes it really challenging is the regulatory people themselves, the FDA and specifically the EMA. Those two organizations, the regulatory reviewers, are a lot smarter now than they were five years ago, six years ago. And I'm not saying they're all brilliant because they're human beings. They're good on some days, they're bad on others. They're human beings, real, real people. But their knowledge over the last five to, to ten years in this area has gone way up. And they see everybody's submission. Right? So if Genentech is submitting a specific way, and Gilead Sciences is submitting a specific way, and they look at Bayer and see what they're submitting, they look at Bullringer Ingelheim, see what they're submitting, and they look at Samsung and see what they're They're going to compare all these companies to each other, all following the same guidance. So what happens is, as the other companies move up, every company has to move up to that same standard which is laid out in ICH. So early on, the expectation is not so high. But today, the expectations are very, very high. And the experience of the regulators is much higher. So this idea of not really understanding mechanistically what makes the drug work that's a huge, huge thing. That's a big, big thing. And we'll look at how do you do that. If you don't really set proper specifications, then your batch failure rates can be quite high. We've seen drug programs with lot failures or batch failure rates of as high as 50% in some cases, 60% in others, 10% in some, 5% in others. What's the failure rate of these? What's the failure rate of the, by the way, it's not zero. They, this is an iPhone, sorry, it's not a Samsung, but okay. <laughs> or, an, or an LG or something else, right? HTC, but um, I'm an American, I, sorry. <laughs> My laptop's a Microsoft, so I, I have a micro, Apple and Microsoft, but this one, yeah, also American. Uh, <laughs> but the suit, yeah, also American, and inside, also American, so no choice. Um, but I work all over the world, right? So I get to see what, what everybody does. But this industry is amazing. Its failure rate is super, super low. Even when Samsung had the battery problem, the failure rate was still low. I think it was only 38 in a million batteries had the problem. So even then, very, very low failure rates. But when we talk about batch failure, we talk about 5% as being pretty good and 95% being good. That's terrible. That's horrible. Batch failure rates of 5%? Are you joking me? That's terrible. But in drug, we think, eh, it's okay. Make another one. And we'll make it work. So what makes these so good? Any idea? By the way, the best quality in the world is semiconductor, by far. The worst quality in the world is this is well known, by the way. The best quality in the world is semiconductor. And the worst quality in the world is? Any idea? Hospital care. Hospital care has the highest defect rates of almost any industry in the world. Doctors and nurses are the worst in the world. And you can go from hospital to hospital around the world. All of them have a serious, serious problem. Wrong drug. Wrong dose. Wrong dr it's super high failure rate. Super high. 
we would be so ashamed. We work so hard to make a good drug. Then they give them the wrong drug or the wrong dose, right? And so we see the difference in quality. Why did QBD come about? Because the FDA thought maybe we should take some of the ideas on what they did and apply it to drug. How do we take world-class quality from the semiconductor guys and apply it to drug? Then they realized, they thought about it a bunch, and they said, what do they do differently that we don't do? And they said, it's, they have very, very high success rates, comparatively, and the way they do that is through characterization and control. If you want to write that down, characterization and control is the strategy that they use. And so the FDA said, gosh, we should do characterization. And we should have way better controls on the drug. And if we had better characterization and control, our success rates would be much higher. So that's kind of where a lot of that genesis came from. A lot of the origin came from this idea that these high uh, failure rates in batch materials are not acceptable really not acceptable, and we can do so much better. These are some of the benefits that we're going to get directly from doing these things. So these are just some things to kind of consider. I don't want to read all these to you, but there are a few things. The number one thing I'm going to talk about, of course, is compliance. Um, compliance, compliance, compliance. So that's going to be number one. Um, other things that we're going to, I'm going to point out to you, is number, fo number four, really, better understanding of the product and better understanding of the process. If you really understood the product and the process, you can set much better limits and specifications on the drug. You can design better IPCs, in-process controls. Um, so better understanding of the product and process are going to give us uh, a big, big benefit. Building skills within our teams, people that actually know how to do development more efficiently. And then, interestingly enough, is better compliance going to make costs go up or go down? Better compliance, will it make costs go up? QBD, will it make costs go up or down? Now, you might think, well, if I do, I'm not doing everything today, and now you want me to do everything, it's going to cost more money. By the way, is, is that important? Is the cost of money important? Do you care about that here in Korea? Oh, you don't care? Ooh. Well, okay. <laughs> this is an important point, and a lot of people miss this idea. The question is, if you're doing a proper development and submission, should that make your cost go up? Interestingly, it will make your cost go down. I'm not sort of sure of it. I am very sure of it. How does it make the cost go down? Because if you do quality by design, you're really doing development by design. So you're doing risk-based approaches to development. You're identifying what must be done what is nice to do, and what is no need to do. And because you're really identifying more clearly what is nice to do, what must be done to put together a proper filing, you're actually able to prioritize the work content more efficiently. And by that, you can now speed up two things. You can increase your time to market, how fast you can go. Certainly, you can keep up with your, regular, your uh, clinical work, and you also can prioritize what experiments, what studies need to be done, and it's not just based on time. Right now you have budget and you have time. That's the wrong idea. You shouldn't just have budget and time. What you should have is that I need these seven studies. If we complete these seven studies, all of our unit operations will be properly characterized and ready for GMP production work, ready for validation. That's what I need. These are the studies I need. Right now, if I went to you and I went into any one of your development organizations and I asked them, what are the exact studies you must do to develop this drug on what timeline? What are the formulation studies you need? What are the analytical method studies you need? What are the process cell cultures that you need? What is the molecular synthesis that you need? What do you need? I'll bet you you would not get a good answer. If you said, what's the exact timeline for all these products? 
that you need. You will not get a good example. What you will hear is, we have two years to do this. We got two years. And how many people do we have? We have these people. And what labs do you have? We have these labs. We have these labs. We have these people. We have this timeline. We have this budget. Do you need that budget? Do you need that timeline? Is that what's necessary? And when the time goes, will we have everything done? So we got to completely step back and think about how we do drug development. Now, how do I know this? And how am I sure? Because I'm working on gene therapy and cell therapy programs. In gene therapy and cell therapy programs, we're getting the same work done in half the time that we did for traditional antibody programs. The same work in half the time. Why are we doing it in half the time? Because the FDA and the clinic said we can. They want a faster, more aggressive timeline on these gene therapy programs and cell therapy programs because of the clinical benefit. So the challenge is, can you still follow ICH but meet a faster timeline? Can you get it done quicker? Can you still be careful? Can you still be, make sure it's safe? Can you still make sure it's effective? So we can see, we can, but we're going to follow this approach to do it. So really saving money is going to be at the heart, and saving time, which is money, is going to be at the heart of what we're going to be interested in here on the QBD. So it will definitely speed up the development timelines. Now, if you want to write down a number, I think you'll find this an interesting point. If you look at traditional drug development and following the ICH guidance, What's the difference in information that you, can that you can squeeze from your development? So you've done your development and the knowledge and information we've had. So if you're from the try family, we try some stuff, we see what works, and we're from the modern, we have good understanding, what's the difference? If you write down the number 10 is the number I would recommend. If you follow the QBD methodology, you will have 10 times more information about the nature of the drug in its drug product and drug substance than you will under traditional development protocols. 10x, at least. And if you ask me to list what are the 10 times, what are those 10 things, I can give them to you very easily. So as we go through different parts of it, you'll see, I'll show you some examples, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Okay, um, we talked about all that. Um, we're going to be using a risk-based approach. This is absolutely critical um, that we want to do that. Risk-based doesn't mean cheat. Risk-based means that we really, and by the way, ICHQ9 is very, very clear what they want. So ha we want to use risk-based approaches because a risk-based approach allows us the flexibility to really decide what is platform, we can decide what is standard process that we use, and we can also decide where there are real development challenges and make sure that we mitigate that risk by doing proper development. So risk-based is absolutely essential in this concept. And basically, if you kind of think of it, risk is generally uh, broken down into different kinds of risk. Things that directly affect safety and efficacy are usually the risks of, of concern. What are the risks? When we talk about risk, what are we talking about? We're talking about safety risks. We're talking about efficacy risk. And if you really come down to that, it's potency and impurities. It's potency and impurities. That's really, what, I mean, what, what's efficacy? It's making sure that the drug is potent. And what is safety? Well, it's making sure that there's not a lot of impurities that could cause something untoward, a problem. So really mapping out what drives potency and what drives purity are really big things in terms of how risk is going to be manifest. So we have to do that. Um, over here, if you're not familiar with an NRE, that stands for non-recurring expense, also called CMC cost. So if... So really what we think is, after you look at using QBD, we should see two benefits. Number one, your CMC costs should be lower. Your development costs should be lower. We think that your development timeline should shrink if you're doing it properly. And then secondly, we think that the cost of your manufacturing is going to go down. Why is the cost of manufacturing going to go down? 
it's going to go down for a couple reasons. Number one, uh, you should be able to have more efficient um, processing times. And number two, we're going to have much lower OOS uh, incidents out of specification incidents, and we're going to have fewer investigations. So if I can get higher yields, I can get better productivity, I can get lower out of specification rates and fewer investigations, my cost of manufacturing is going to definitely go down. No question about it. Now, does the agency care about cost? Does the FDA care about cost? No. Does the EMA care about cost? Nope. KFDA care about cost? No. CFDA care about cost? No. Can we tell them about cost? No. Do we have to care about cost? Oh, yeah. We do. We do. The, man, the developers and the manufacturers, we care about cost. We care about cost savings. And we care about manufacturing cost. The agencies don't care about it at all. And they're not supposed to. Just to be clear, why should they? It's their job to make sure good quality, make sure good compliance. You take care of the cost. But if we can get very good cost and very good compliance, oh my gosh, perfect, perfect. That's what we want. That'd be the best. Okay, and again, we said that the semiconductor industry has been using this. Um, just to be honest with you, the first uh, about five, six years of my career, I spent in semiconductor. So I, I come from working with fabrication of semiconductor devices, uh, process, assembly, and test operations. I have a science background and also an engineering background. So the first job in my career was semiconductor. So I learned all of the things the semiconductor industry was doing to drive quality uh, and get high yields and get good control over their product and process. So I, I had an amazing experience in that semiconductor industry learning about all the techniques and how they do it. Uh, when I started into a uh, drug in 2000, I started into drugs. So I've been working in drug design and manufacture for the last 19 years. Um, I immediately knew exactly what the FDA was talking about when they talked about quality by design. Because I'm going like, that's just semiconductor process. That's nothing new, nothing original, nothing clever. They just stole the idea from semiconductor guys. But it was new for the drug people. It was new for the small molecule people. It was new for the vaccine. It was brand new for the uh, biology. And the, the funny thing that I heard was the biology guys said, well, this QBD stuff, it's very good for the small molecule guys. Like, they could really benefit from this. But we're dealing with life. Life is so different. Nothing is the same. So it's not really good for us. Then later, people went, well, maybe it's OK. Today, that is completely wrong. Today, the biologics groups around the world understand and are applying the QBD concepts to biologics. All of the filings today are being looked at from a QBD filing. So this concept that biologics is special, doesn't really apply to them, that's a, an excuse. That's not really true. It has no basis in fact. And it's not like the FDA is saying, oh, Pharma has to do this, but biologics, they don't need. No. This is the famous uh, QBD wheel that we have. From, uh, this comes from the FDA. This was their original idea. Part of it, I think, is fantastic. Part of it is a bit wrong. So I'll show you what I think it is right, and I'll show you what maybe needs some tuning. So they broke it down this way. They said, OK, on the outside is product knowledge. And we'll talk more about what exactly is that, because remember that in our filings, we have to prove to the FDA and the EMA and globally, we have to prove that we do have this product knowledge. If you ever expect any country to accept your drug, you have to follow the regulatory. So we have to demonstrate we have good product knowledge. And I'll, there's usually three or four key things there we'll talk about. And the other thing we have to show is that we have really good process understanding. So those are the two things that we're trying to prove. We need to make sure we have good product specifications that explain what the requirements are. That maps out all of the program requirements. Uh, CQAs, what are the product quality attributes? What do those look like? Um, and those are our critical attributes. And then over here, um, it says uh, product design. That's the dosage. 
that's all the excipients, that's the formulation that you're going to put it in, and that, that's its stability. So all that's pretty good. The only thing they left out in that picture is the analytical method. They're just assuming that in order to measure a quality attribute, you have to have an analytical method. But as you and I know, the, the quality of those analytical methods is absolutely essential. And those uh, people that are working on bioassays as well, those, all those analytical and test methods also fall in there. So QBD is all about formulation. QBD is all about characterizing and controlling the analytical methods. So these are really huge parts of that product. So the thing that they didn't put in is they didn't put in the key parameters. So they put process parameters over here. What about the key parameters of the analytical method? Oops, they forgot. Next, we have down here the process understanding. So here's all our process parameters. Here's the process design. So here's this whole idea of a design space. Have you heard of design space before? Now, here's the good question for all of you in this room. What in the world is the purpose of a design space? And you might think of what is written often. People say it's for regulatory flexibility. It's for all these good things. It's really for one thing and one thing only, control. The purpose of a design space, if you want to write this down, is for improved control of your process. So you cannot make adjustments on a unit operation without a design space. And you cannot make an adjustment unless there is an intent to control it and improve that control. So what makes the semiconductor guys really, really, really great? Process control. They're super good at it. We would never get, these things would never work if you didn't have good process control. We don't sit there and go, oh, it turned on. Wow, amazing. It works. Oh, no, we, it works. Of course, it works every day. It should work. Hopefully no fire. As long as there's no fire, it's good. But it must work. And again, the control that you have is essential in this. So not only are we looking at the unit operator, ah, the control strategy. You see that? So really thinking, stepping back and thinking about process control in biologics, process control in cell culture, process control in purification, process control in formulation, process control in fill, process control in molecular synthesis for the small molecule people, process control in all elements of our drug manufacturing, including the QC laboratory, and all of the analytical methods. So stepping back, taking a deep breath, and rethinking what is process control in a drug manufacturing environment. Now, here's a key question for you. Whose responsibility is it to design the controls? Is that GMP uh, facility? No. CMC, yes. So the controls have to be designed by the CMC development team, and they have to be tech transferred into the GMP facility. If you do it that way, and then you must file it, and it must be approved by the regulatory agency. Those are the steps you have to do. Designed by CMC, filed in the filings, approved by the agencies, you have yourself an approved design space. So the purpose of the design space is for one thing and one thing only. It's for the design space is for one purpose, one thing only. It's designed for control, 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 control. Nothing else. Everything else is just pretty, pretty pictures. Oh, OK. Uh, everything else is just pretty pictures. You can show a design space, make a nice graph, but it doesn't do anything. So we really want that for control, and that's really what they were looking for over here. And then it says over here that you use your control strategy in the drug manufacturing, and then we monitor our process performance. Now, they're showing that they want a measure called CPK. CPK is a wrong measure, actually. The concept is right. The measurement is wrong. We should not be using CPK. 
So if you know about CPK or if you've heard of CPK, that is an incorrect measure. It's an old idea from the 1950s. So we don't use that anymore. We, today we use what is called PPM, and I will show you a demonstration. I'll show you an example of how we do it. PPM is parts per million, and we'll be looking at failure rates in PPM or in parts per million. So I'll show you an example of that so we can see it. CPK, we don't use it anymore. That's an old idea. I'm not the only one that thinks this. There's uh, other people that do technical presentations. They also agree should not be used. Okay, again here, which guidance documents are we talking about? Here they are. I don't want to read them, but just for reference. Uh, and again, on analytical methods, these are kind of the guidance documents we look at for on the methods as well. So just for reference. All right, let's go through. We've got 10 of these to do. We've got uh, a few hours to get this done. Here we go. So let's start out with the first one here and that is establishing a clear line of sight. So what this idea is, this concept of a line of sight. So if you think about that and, and get an idea of that, that will really help a lot. And let's kind of think about how it works. So again, ICH, FDA, EMA kind of set the guidance on what some of the things that we want. Uh, we then look at the target population or indication. What is this drug for? Who is it for? What people specifically will it serve? What age group are they? What ethnicity are they? What country are they? Uh, who is the health authority for that? Uh, are there already in the marketplace a competing drug that's already doing the same thing? Are we uh, late entry? Are we the innovator? We're bringing in the new drug? So kind of what's that? What is the clinical uh, as aspects of this? What are the doctor needs? And what are some of the things like ease of application, ease of use? Is this an injectable? Is this a cream? Is this a tablet? So what, what's the um, method of administration? And what does that really kind of look like? And then what are these basic uh, health authorities? Well, what does line of sight mean? What does that mean exactly? Here is the best picture I can show you that would help you to understand and visualize what a proper line of sight looks like. And um, when you get this idea, it's really exciting because there's two reasons why you want it. Number one, if you're making the drug, if you're designing the drug, if you're doing the CMC work for the drug, you want to make sure that at each aspect of that, we've really done a good job of mapping out the product knowledge, we've really done a good job of understanding the process, and then that's really going into the actual validation of the method, validation of the analytical method, and the validation of the process. The other thing, too, is if you can understand it, and it's easy to understand, it's super easy for the regulatory community to take this clear line of sight and communicate it in the filing. So it's, it's beneficial both ways. Number one, you understand it, and you can manage it and do a good job in project management. And number two, it's an easy story to tell. Okay, well, what does that look like exactly? Well, it looks like this. So we first of all, and I'll show you s some examples and some of the tools that we use to keep these things organized. So this is it's two things. Number one, it's a concept. And number two, it's a set of tools. So I'm going to show you both of them. I'm going to show you the concept, and I'm going to show you the set of tools. Everything I show you today, you can get a copy of. So anything that I show, and you can communicate with the, the people that communicated with you to get copies of everything I give you today. So if you see something, go, ooh, I'd like a copy of that. Request it. We'll make sure I give it to the, uh, the seminar coordinators, and then they can communicate it to you as well. So don't, you don't have to write everything down. But some things, sure, definitely. OK, TPP, target, product, profile, QTPP, quality target, product, profile. The QTPP is mandatory. The TPP is not. So this must be submitted. Basically, the goal of that particular document is it defines all of the development requirements. It defines the program requirements. Uh, that's both clinically and then it also uh, defines things like stability. It defines all of the various elements of that drug program and maps out all the program requirements. So that must be submitted. The CQAs are also a mandatory submission item. So we have to define what are critical quality attributes. And 
it, sometimes people argue, well, gee, you know, how do you know that's critical? It's a, it's a drug quality attribute. Maybe it's not critical. So the, the easy, easy way to think of it is if you're going to ever use it as a release test, it's critical. If it's ever going to be used as part of your panel of release tests on the drug, that by definition is a CQA, critical quality attribute. If it's going to be, if a measurement is going to be used for characterization, then you don't have to argue. So I might do certain types of evaluations to characterize the molecule, to characterize the protein, to characterize the API, to characterize impurities. I may or may not use those for part of my test panel for release testing. So we would generally not consider those CQAs, but we would certainly consider them essential for molecular characterization, protein characterization, understanding the behavior of the drug and key elements. I'll show you our templates on how we like to map out and organize the CQAs. Okay. By the way, this is also should be risk-based, risk-based approach as well on these. Okay, and then now we're going to come down here to our flow down. So now we're going to say, well, what's the process by which you're going to make the drug? What cell line are you going to use? What master cell bank will you be using? Uh, are you going to do, be doing genetic modification? Uh, what's the vector that you're creating for that genetic modification? What is the key constituents or reagents that you're planning on using? So what are all those defined materials and processes that we need for drug substance? And specifically, what might those look like for drug product? So we'll usually lay that out and define what that is. This is going to evolve. So in early phase, we may have one form of what that process looks like. And by the time we get to phase two or even phase three, the final form of that process may be defined. And so that may change as we do our development. So we don't assume that that's fixed. We assume that that is dynamic and changing. Then over here, we're going to do what is called a high-level risk assessment. And this is, uh, this is where the real fun kicks in. Um, and I, if, you're not, if you're not used to those terms, high-level risk assessment and low-level risk assessment, let me uh, help you with that just to get the idea across. Because this, this is one of those like big, big, big ideas and makes a tremendous difference. So in a high-level risk assessment, we lay out the entire process from beginning to end. And that can be the cell culture process. That can be from harvest to end of purification. That can be from final formulation to final fill. So you can lay, that can be from molecular synthesis into uh, tablet pressing. So whatever steps in your process, we've got that laid out into what I would consider reasonably well-defined elements. And that can be either two or three, could be as many as four. If that's five, six, seven, I don't understand what you're doing. But it should be very defined. So again, you might have a cell culture, high-level risk assessment. You might have a purification, high-level risk assessment. You might have a fill and finish, high-level risk assessment. Three, four biologics is typical. If I was in small molecule and I was starting at the API generation, I would have the API, the manufacturer creation of the API. And then I would have my actual uh, addition of excipients, bringing it up to a tablet. And then I would have my final fill and weigh out and moisture, all the other attributes. So high level. Multiple unit operations. That's the key idea. It's not a unit operations. It's a sequence of multiple unit operations. Now, the concept of this one is the question at, at the high level risk assessment is how do the unit operations influence CQAs? You might want to write that down. At the high level, the question is, how do these unit operations influence the CQAs? Now, if you argue that that step in the process has low or little influence, how much work do we need to do? If you argue that a unit operation, a key process step, has little influence, then how much work do we need to do? The ICH says the development should be commensurate with the risk. Where you have a lot of risk, you need more development. Where you have low risk, you don't need to have so aggressive of a development strategy. So that's the high level. Lay that out. Look at where we need studies. 
Where can we say platform? We just use our standard process. Save a lot of money. Easy. Where do we say, this drug program is so unique, so different than our traditional ones, or there's a good chance for the formation of impurities, uh, et cetera. So high-level risk assessment helps to identify where we need development. That's the purpose. The question is, where do we need development? And the answer is, we need these five studies, we need these four studies, we need these three studies. If you do those, we should have good characterization of the process good characterization of the unit operations. These are the unit operations that need attention. These are the unit operations, no need. Now, with that in mind, we can go a lot faster because we know exactly what we need and we know exactly what we don't need. And today, if I ask you that, what do you need exactly? What do you not need exactly? Where is that definition? I don't know. That tells you people are lost. They're just, you just trust. They're just doing what they want to do because they like it. It's very true, by the way. Scientists love to go to the labs. Scientists love the lab. That's their playground. They want to play. We don't want them to play. We want them to develop. Stop playing. Start developing. So with a high-low risk assessment, it identifies exactly where we need that development to make sure that we have. Now, why do I argue that? Because I have line of sight, QTPP to CQAs, CQAs to define materials and process, high level risk assessment, which identifies unit operations that need development with risk. And that's where I need to put time and money and to characterize these unit operations to make sure we have good understanding of what influences CQA. That's the concept. Now, once you get down there, the next one is low-level risk assessment. And if you want to just make a little note, low-level risk assessment is one unit operation, just one. So that's a bioreactor, that's a capture column, that's a molecular synthesis, that's a partic particular step in the process, it's just one, it's a filtration process, whatever that might be. It's a single unit operation. So again, we have to define what is a unit operation and what is not. And then these are going to go down and look at temperature, time, pH, flow, concentration. It's going to go look at all of those detailed factors that might influence your drug at that unit op. It also identifies which CQA specifically do we need to measure. So over here, CQA will also drop down to here, and I'll ask the question, which CQAs do I have to measure? All of them? Or just these three? Or just these two? So getting that information and wrapping that in here, that's really key. Now, at the same point, here comes our analytical methods. So how can I understand that? So analytical methods have to be developed for release testing and IPC. Those are the two objectives for that. Can I get some water, by the way? And we, we will take a break at 11.30, is that right? 11.30, so if you think, will he ever stop talking? Yes, I promise, <laughs> I need a break too. <laughs> so uh, 11.30, we'll take a break. So um, over here we have the development of our analytical method, and low-level risk assessments are also used for these for method robustness. So if you wanna draw a connection, uh, the low-level risk assessments are not only used for process, but they're also used for the analytical methods to identify the factors that may influence accuracy and repeatability of the method. So they're also used there as well. And then finally, we're doing the characterization of the formulation, the dose, and the stability. So again, this is where designed experiments are going to be used. And not only are we going to know that certain formulations are stable, we're going to know what makes them stable. So design of experiments are going to be used in formulation studies to make sure that we characterize the actual sensitivity of what makes the drug stable and by how much and what are the limits that we need to have. This right here is our product knowledge. Define CQAs, define formulation, define analytical and test method is the story of what our product is all about. 
And then in addition to that, up here in the QTPP, we'll bring in the clinical piece, right? We'll bring in the PK and all of the uh, physiological responses to the drug, and we'll add that clinical knowledge into this, and there's our product knowledge. How does it perform in the body? How do we make it? How do we formulate it? What makes it stable? How do we measure it? How do we control the measurement? That's product knowledge. And we need a good story on that. We need to have a good package. Really shows that we have that good understanding. The agencies look at that and say, you know your stuff. You've got it. Okay, down here on the bottom, our good old friends, the process. So now, from the unit operations, we're doing the process characterization. And from that, we're picking the actual set points. So we're picking the actual targets, the set points. Now, let me show you a, a difference in semiconductor and drug. When drug does manufacturing, the way that they do it is they establish a range. And they'll say, as long as your batch record is in this range, it's good. And the range will be a pH of 6.2 to a range of 6.8. As long as you stay in that pH range, everything in that range is good. Release the material, off you go. This is absolutely wrong concept. 100% wrong, wrong, wrong. You can't make it stupider. It's about as stupid an idea as there ever was. That is not right. The semiconductor industry doesn't do it that way. So look at the difference here. Just follow me for a minute. When you listen to what I say, you'll think, wow, this guy's crazy. I'm not crazy. <laughs> listen to me for a second. So it's true, by the way, it's true that the batch record will have limits, and if you make it within limits, the, batch rec the material can move. That's true, and I don't disagree. But the concept that that's equally good at each pH value, that's wrong. A 6.2 product, if the target is 6.5, and I make it at 6.2, are you telling me that's as good? And if you're telling me at 6.1, that's no good, but 6.2 is fine? Really? But your target is 6.5, so what should we be manufacturing? 6.5. So what should we tell our operators? pH adjust to 6.5. Yeah, you fall within limits, it's still okay. But process to target. Please, if you'll write this down, this is a massively different concept in drug. If you process to target, what's going to happen? To your process consistency. If you say you need a certain concentration in solution and you process to that target concentration and you do it every time, what will happen to your consistency? What will happen to your variation? By the way, is variation good or bad in drug manufacturing? Is variation good or variation bad in drug manufacturing? I'll try one more time. Is variation good in drug manufacturing? Or is it really not good? It's not good. Why? Because you'll create failures. So processing to target in most cases will give you a 50% reduction in variation. So telling people that everything in this range is just as good, that's not true. This target is the best, and every deviation is just not as good. But when you get to the limit, that's where you've got to stop. So we've got to start thinking about completely change. By the way, the semiconductor industry knows this. They've been doing this for the last 20 years. Every, it, you could go in tomorrow and take away all the specifications in a semiconductor facility, and they would make as good or better a product because they process to target. Once you decide, a, by the way, if you go look at your batch record, and you look in there, it says uh, pH 6.2 to 6.8. What's the target? It's not even specified. Wow, stupid idea, really wrong concept. So we have to step back and take a deep breath and think through that. And that's where this right here, it says, let's make sure we get the very best set point. And then let's make sure that in our batch records, in our documentation, and our manufacturing, when we tell somebody that that's the target concentration, or that's the target solution, or that's the target uh, gravimetric weight, we make sure that they know what that target is and they're communicated to process to that target. And I, I've done this with different drug companies and we can see that dramatic 
reduction in variation. So this makes a big difference right there. Next one, our good old friend, the design space and the tolerance design, we need to define those operational limits. Now, this is another area where we've had a lot of problems. How do people know how to set the spec? The specification controls quality. So how do you assure that that specification is right? So again, with a QBD approach, modern approach, we will have the justification. I'll show you how we know how to set these limits. CPPs, critical process parameters, CMAs, this is not a risk assessment. It's a measurement. So when we talk about what makes a process parameter critical, CPPs, these CPPs are mandatory. They're part of our submission. And that is something that we have to do define and document, and that becomes part of our process understanding. This also comes directly from our DOE work. Okay, and then finally, we get to our, our friend validation. So when we think about validation and control, this is where for now we can actually use the design space. If we detect a drift and we know how to correct it, we can correct it. Uh, this is where our advanced control concepts come into play, and this is where all our operational limits come into play. Uh, in 2011, and then there was an update also in 2015, the validation documentation, uh, phase one or stage one of the validation, says you must show your process understanding. So this process understanding is the first step in validation. If this has not been well done, your validation by definition is also not well done. <coughs> and then, I don't want to read this, but this goes to that, that goes to this, this goes to that, that goes to this, do, 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 do. At the very end, you release. So that's what line of sight is. And if you do it properly, you can go from the bottom and look up. You can find that. You can go from the top and look down. Everything is nicely connected. If you don't do that, you end up with stuff. Just some stuff that you tried and some stuff that some experiments that you ran and some people went to their lab and did some work. But there's no story. I've talked, by the way, I've talked to regulatory people that try to write uh, filings, BLAs, other kinds of regulatory filings. And they say, I love this so much. Oh, by the way, the FDA comment from filings that are done this way, they would come back to us and say, I loved your filing. Really? You loved our filing? We loved your filing. Well, why did you love it? What, was, what, did, what, what made you love our filing? Because, I mean, that's not easy, right? And they said, oh, so easy to understand. So easy to follow. Think about it. You should make it hard for the regulatory people or easy for them. By the way, if it's easy for you, it should be easy for them. If it's hard for you to understand what you did, it's going to be hard for you to communicate it. So the other big advantage is you'll find happy regulatory people that like it because they understand it and they can support it. Okay, let's uh, start this one and then we'll maybe take a break. So just a few more minutes to stay, keep my eyes on the clock. Um, so risk management, again, is in every aspect of it. So this is going to apply to our analytical methods. This is going to apply to our formulations. This is going to apply to our process. Everything's going to be risk-based. So, and I'll show you some, some tools that we can use for that. Probably a good way to think about it or a good way to look at it is something like this. So over here at the high end, there's the voice of the market what the indication is, voice of the customer. Again, that's from the, uh, both from the regulatory perspective as well as from the clinical. Uh, what are some of the key requirements for the drug? And then breaking those down into three different development steps. So system design, parameter design, and tolerance design. And we're going to be using risk management as we lay that out. So DOE by itself is not really that helpful. Uh, risk assessments by themselves are not very helpful. But when you put those together, you take proper risk assessment and put it together with a good experimental strategy, wow, magic starts to happen. Really, really good things start to happen. Um, so that's kind of what we're looking for. And then parameter design, if you want to put a note to yourself, targets. 
what is the target for temperature? What's the target for pH? What's the target for concentration? What's the target for flow? What are all these targets? Salt concentration, all the elements that we have to put together. Targets, targets, targets. And then tolerances. What's the maximum allowable window that we should map out to guarantee good performance? Normal operating ranges, proven acceptable ranges, nor and par ranges as well. Go into that. And then making sure that we have validated our work and then making sure that our control strategy is integrated. The biggest difference between traditional and modern is the emphasis on control. The singular biggest difference between traditional and modern is the emphasis on the concept of a design space and the concept of a design space is for the concept of a design space is for I'm seeing if you're awake. Are you awake? Is your coffee working? Uh, for control. For control. So always remember, design space has one function, one function only for control. Why do you need a design space? So you can make an adjustment. Why do you need an adjustment? For control. The FDA says you can have them. You request them, we must approve them. You can have them. But you show us you need it and request it, and you can have it. Okay, and so that's kind of how we're mapping that out. This is right out of the guidance. This is the way they think of it. So they think it has kind of a, a risk assessment, a risk control. Now, let's think about, and maybe make a note here for yourself. We said we identified so far two different risk assessments. High level, what's the reason for that? High level is to identify unit operations with risk. And low level, factors and responses. So your temperature, time, pressure, flow, all that. So high level, which unit operations need development? Low level, which factors need characterization? Different question. So that's the risk assessment. Now, the risk control is two, and, and I really like this because this says something important. It says you have two choices when you've identified a potential risk to a, by the way, it's always risk to a CQA. Risk to what? It's safety and efficacy, folks, CQAs. That's what it's risk to. So when I lay out the risk, I really have two things I can do. I can do risk reduction, or the other thing I can do is I can just say it's okay, don't worry. Is that okay? Yeah, that's okay. The, the agency says that if you have a scientifically justifiable reason to accept that risk, it's okay. We can take the risk. You can take the risk. But you have to understand that risk, and you have to decide that that risk is acceptable. Now, to do the risk reduction, what are those activities that we will do? And if you want to write a little note to yourself, normally the two risk reduction technique things that we have is experimentation, right? Design of experiments. So by characterizing these unit operations, we can lay that out. And the second one that we can do is we can put in an IPC, an in-process control. That's about it. Those are the two primary risk reduction strategies we have. To do the characterization and control, that'll give us a good set point, that'll give us good operational limits, to make sure we have a well-defined process and well-defined method. So again, the two things we can do on risk reduction is number one, experimentation, DOE specifically. And the second one is putting in additional controls. Usually they're in-process controls that we'll add. That's it. We don't have a lot else. And the rest is accept the risk. Is it okay to take risk? Yes. Are you ever going to do everything? No. Then how do you justify you didn't do it? This way. You have to show that you've considered it. You have to look at it objectively. And you have to justify that you're not doing certain work because it doesn't likely to impact the CQAs. And that's the argument we're going to make. Based on what? How do you know? How do you, by the way, we have things we know and things we don't know. What if we don't know? How do we do risk assessment? We really don't know. Well, the, the agencies have an answer for that, too. 
They say it should be based on the first order principles of science. Science based, number one. And number two, experience with the molecule, experience with the antibody, experience with the protein, experience with that particular process. Process knowledge, process experience. Either justification is acceptable to them, but they want to understand what you know and why you think so. Okay, good. Let's stop right there. Let's take a break. Uh, how long? 15 minutes, is it? What's your schedule say? 10, 15? They're my master. I obey what they say. 15 minutes. Okay, 15 minutes. We'll start again.